Amen, amen. How many of you believe that God is great? Greatly to be praised. Hey, today's Resurrection Day. That's right. But something uh, you might want to be, might want to go ahead and put in your thinking here at Grace Chapel. We celebrate that every Sunday. That's why we're here. Hey, one announcement, and then we're going to transition into observing the Lord's Supper. We do that every Sunday here at Grace Chapel. Uh, you don't have to be a member to observe the Lord's Supper with us. We do ask that you are saved and water baptized. If those two things are taking place in your life, you're more than welcome to join with us. The announcement is this. On Wednesday, April the 10th at 6 p.m., we're having a family movie night in here. And uh, there'll be concessions and food, um, nachos and that kind of stuff that will be available. And all the proceeds are going toward the youth summer trip to help them go on their youth summer trip. We, we do something a little different. We have a trip, and it's also combined with services at night, devotions during the day. So there's a spiritual emphasis uh, that's also provided. So if you can help us out on Wednesday, April the 10th at 6 p.m., be here that night. You know, be prepared to spend a little money, buy some snacks, and help our youth. That would be great. All right, we're going to serve communion. This side of the congregation can go to the table and get your elements. This side can go over there and get them. Bring them back and have a seat. We will observe communion together. There are many benefits to observing communion particularly on a weekly basis, because it's a very visible, visual reminder of everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. And speaking of the cross, since today is the resurrection day, that will be our emphasis. Jesus Christ did not die for anything that he did. He died for everything I have done. And will do. And the same applies to you. That's the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection assured that our sins are forgiven, our salvation is purchased, our eternal destination is sure. And while we wait for heaven or his second return, we experience blessings here on the earth right now. And one of the things that I want to encourage Christians with is this thought. Your worst day on earth is the worst you will ever experience for all eternity. For a sinner who has not come to faith in Christ, their best day on the earth is the best they will ever experience for all eternity. That puts it in perspective, doesn't it? That's why the scripture is true that our trials and our afflictions are light compared to the eternal weight of glory. And that was all provided for us because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and following, uh, Jesus is eating his last meal before he is betrayed. He takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, he passes it out among the disciples, and he said, take, eat, all of you, for this is my body. Pastor William, will you stand and give the prayer, please? After he had given thanks, he passed it out among the disciples and he said, take, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant that was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Pastor Keith, will you pray, sir? together, please.
Amen. If you would, if you'll stand to your feet. Father, we ask that as we enter into worship, that your spirit would sweep into this place, Lord God, that we would have an encounter with you this morning. Lord, help us to be focused on the reason why we are here, and that is to worship you, to bring you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name. And everyone said, You were the word at the beginning. Thank you. 
His name is powerful. And there's some of you in this room today that have been praying. Or maybe you've been scared to ask God to do the miraculous. But today, our God is able. If He can rise from the dead, if He can set us free from death, hell, and the grave, can He do a small miracle for you? Can He heal the sick? Can He raise the dead? Our God is able. Today, let's believe and trust in Him that He can do what He said He could do. Hallelujah. They say this mountain can't be They say these chains will never But they don't know you like me do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no
declares it in the heavens, it is done. Whether you see it right now, whether you feel any change, our God has said it. And he is a God who keeps his promises. He never, ever lies. He is perfect in all of his ways. And if he said it, he will do it. All we have to do is believe it and trust in him and walk with him and follow him and submit to him. You can't do it your way. It's not going to look like you want it to look. If you try to do it your way, you're going to miss the Father. You're going to miss his blessings. You're going to miss his miracle. You're going to miss his deliverance in your family. You better submit yourself to the Father today. Submit yourself to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will never disappoint you. He will never take advantage of you. He will never mislead you. He will never guide you in the wrong direction. He is a man of his word. And he made promises to you. And he will keep them. You said it. So I believe it. You said it. Some may be here this morning or possibly listen to us online at some point in the future and you ask yourself, what, what, what are they singing? God has said it, so I believe it. Well, has God spoken? And the answer is yes. It's in his word. And anything that God impresses upon you, reveals to you in your prayer time, or maybe dreams or visions does not go beyond his word has God spoken yes if you want to know what God's promises to you are know his word when you get into his word you know his promises and then you know they are yes and amen in Jesus Christ so you must come in covenant faith with the Lord Jesus Christ what does that mean repent of your sin place your faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And you'll come in covenant relationship with him. And all of the blessings of Abraham are then placed upon you as a child of God. So I encourage you this morning, take a moment right where you are to raise your hand. And if the Lord has been dealing with you about something, as we were encouraged this morning in this song, simply say out of your own heart and mouth, I believe it. I believe it. It will come to pass. I believe it. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for every person that's in here this morning. Thank you, Lord, that they've received your instruction, your encouragement through our worship. Lord, as we transition into the preaching of the word, 
I pray that there would be a maintained an atmosphere of faith where they would hear, they would receive, and that you would get all the glory. It's in Jesus' name. If you believe that, say amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of the Lord. As we have a little transition here, you can go ahead and take your Bible into your hand and turn in it to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. 1 Samuel, chapter 17. At this time, we're going to dismiss our kids. If you're in grades kindergarten through fifth grade, you can make your way um, over to the door. You'll be escorted to your class. <laughs> Everybody looks nice in their Easter outfits, Resurrection Day outfits. Today, the scriptures will be from the English Standard Version. 1 Samuel chapter 17 will be where our text is read from. You ever noticed that sports fans live and die with their team? It's like they experience all the emotional highs and all the emotional lows of a season. And if something happens on the field or on the court, it's almost like the person sitting in his lazy boy accomplished the same thing as that athlete on the screen. You know what I'm saying? It's like a quarterback makes a good move. He sets up, throws down the field. I mean, perfect strike for a touchdown. And never struggles to get off the couch and go, yeah! You know what I mean? In his mind, he thinks he can still do it, but he can't even get off the couch. Or, or like, right now it's March Madness, right? It's March Madness. So like, Caitlin Clark, right? She comes down to court, and, you know, she does a little move, brings it up. She puts it in your eye, man, from like the timeline. And everybody, including me, man, when I watch that girl play, I'm like, whoa, that girl's awesome. And then something happens, and you're like, oh, my goodness, they're horrible. It's kind of natural for people to feel that way about a team, assuming that they care, right? I mean, that they're sports fans. I don't know. Some of you may be NASCAR. NASCAR is an interesting sport to watch, isn't it? You stand here and go. Woo! Woo! Right? Every time the car drives by, you yell for like two seconds. Not knocking NASCAR, but I figured it out. The same thing with track and field. Go as fast as you can and keep turning left. And if the race driver has a wreck, I mean, your heart sinks. Because you experience vicariously what that athlete is experiencing. In a similar way, the scriptures relay the same story. First and second Samuel in your Bible was originally put together as one book. And the author of Samuel wrote his book for a very particular purpose. It is highly skilled, highly selective to prove one point. It is trust in the house of David. You see, there was some conflict between should Saul be king? Should David be king? So people split up, man, they had their teams, and they were experiencing the highs and lows of whatever was going on in Saul's life, whatever was going on in David's life. And at the time that Samuel was written, those who were hoping in the house of David, who were trusting in the house of David to be the king of Israel, was experiencing an emotional low. They were struggling. David had, had went into sin. The, the kings who followed him had went into sin. And so there was some hard times coming upon the nation. 
And the writer of Samuel wrote to say, no, 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 remember, guys, you chose Saul to be king. God chose David to be king. And he also promised that out of the lineage of David would come the greater David, whose name is Jesus. And he will reign on the throne of his father David forever. Now, let's read our text. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 46 through 47 in the English Standard Version. This day the Lord would deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. If I had to put a title on this message, I would call it Goliath and the Gospel. Verse 17, I'm sorry, First Samuel chapter 17 opens up with a description of a battle that has taken place between the Philistines and Israel. And it's interesting. The Philistines are standing on one mountaintop. There's a valley. And on the other mountain is Israel, the army of Israel. And that valley in between them, the scripture said, is the valley of Elah. So you have the Philistines over there, Israel over here. And they would get dressed for battle. So, I mean, they had their, their armor, they had their weapons or everything that they would use for war. And they would line up in their ranks. And then the other army would do the same. And they would stand and they would yell at each other. You know, beat their chest. You know, that kind of thing. Ah, you know, the battle cries. And then eventually, the Philistines sent out a champion into the valley. His name Goliath. And when you read the description of Goliath, this guy is literally a giant. He ranges anywhere from 9 feet 5 inches tall to 9 feet 9 inches tall. It kind of depends on who you read. But let's just say he's close to 10 feet. If you're 9 foot 5, I'm going ahead and say you're 10. I mean, this guy is massive. Just the weight of the the, the breastplate and things that he wore was somewhere around 130 pounds. You can imagine the spear size that this guy would have. And it says just the spearhead alone was about 16 pounds. I mean, this guy was massive. And he would come out into the valley. And he would insult the Israelite army that's standing on that side of the mountaintop. He's like, oh, you bunch of sissies. I'm the champion of the Philistines. Instead of both armies fighting... Why don't you pick out somebody to come down and fight me? I dare, I double dog dare you. Send somebody down here to fight me. And it's winner take all. If I win, I own you. But if you win, you own us. And when the Israelites saw their Philistine champion come into the valley, they all got scared. All of a sudden, they all went, oh, <coughs> hiding behind rocks, like hoping nobody calls on him to be the champion to go down into the valley. And what's crazy is that happened for 40 days. Can you imagine? You're a soldier, and you get up every day, you get dressed, and you stand in your position on a mountain, you yell at the other people, they get dressed, they take their position on the mountain, they're yelling at the other people until the champion Goliath comes down in the middle and he's like, bring it on. And then it got quiet and everybody was scared, nobody would fight. Okay? Leave that scene right there. Everybody close your eyes. Open up. Now, we're in a pasture. There's a guy named David. He's tending a few sheep. His father calls him in from the field. His father's name is Jesse. He says, hey, David, you know your brothers, at least three of them, Scripture tells us, are with Saul. They're in battle, array against the Philistines. 
Will you go check on them? In fact, I want you to go bearing gifts. I want you to take some grain, I want you to take some bread, and I want you to take some cheese. And I want you to go check on your brothers, and I want you to give them these gifts, give their commanders these gifts, make sure they're doing okay, and bring back a token, like let me know that they're okay. So David is sent by his father, bearing gifts, to go see his brothers, to bless his brothers. So David goes, and when David walks up on the scene, he witnesses what's taking place. Israel on one side, Philistines on another, Goliath in the middle talking trash, challenging anybody to come fight him. And David is shocked at what he hears. He walks around, he's like, y'all going to let him talk to you like that? I'll fight him. And his older brother got upset with him. He's like, no, I know the intentions of your heart. You're just evil. You said you came down here to bring us gifts, but you really just want a name for yourself. You're glory hog. And David goes, man, shut up, huh? I'll fight anybody. I'll fight. And then everybody got upset with him. But in the process, word got back to King Saul. King Saul says, man, if you fight for me, I've offered this for everybody. If you go down and fight Goliath and you win, I'll give you all the money you could want. I'll make you rich. Better than that, listen to this, people. I'll make your whole family tax-free in the land. Wouldn't that be awesome? It's like the IRS says, you know what, because, you're, because you beat Goliath, you and nobody in your family has to pay any more taxes. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then he said, I'll give you my daughter to marry. That's a big deal, too, because you're coming into the, to the royal family at that point. David's like, all right, I'll fight him. But then... Saul said, I want you to do it a certain way. Takes off his armor, what he would wear to battle, puts it on David. David walked around for a little bit, and he's like, I can't, I can't fight in this. I haven't tested it. It wouldn't be wise. I haven't trained in this. I can't wear this. It doesn't fit properly. It's not made for me. I'm not going to fight like this. Takes it off, gives it back to King Saul, takes his staff, because he's a shepherd, walks down as he's going down to sees a brook, takes up five smooth stones from his brook, puts it in his pouch because he's also got a slingshot. So now, the champion Goliath comes down and he's in the valley. And he says, I'll fight anybody, bring it on. But it's winner take all. If I win, I own you. If you win, you own us. And all of a sudden, he sees David coming down with his little, his little staff, his little pouch hanging off of him, and a slingshot. And Goliath, who's like, you know, almost 10 foot tall, starts talking smack. Man, he goes, what am I, a dog? Did you come to me with sticks? I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air, him beast of the field. And David goes, bet. David ups the ante. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord, you uncircumcised Philistine. It was like you could hear a mic drop. He's like, you little punk, you're nothing, you're a nobody. You're not even circumcised. You're not in covenant with God. You're nobody. In fact, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to kill all your buddies too, and I'm going to feed them to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Puck. Now, that's J.C. Murphy version. If you read ESV, it's not going to sound or read exactly like that, but it's, it's, it's in the spirit of what David did. And Goliath got upset. Goliath was like, all right. So Goliath starts walking toward him. You can imagine this big old giant. I mean, almost 10 foot tall. Don't take him long to get through the valley. You know, he's taking his step. David, on this side, wasn't going to let him walk to him. He starts running at him. And while he's running at him, he grabs his stone, puts it in a sling. We say slingshot. It wasn't one of these things. Okay, it was one of the, 
they were waving their hand. You had to be really skilled with this slingshot. And so he puts in this on, and he's running, he's waving that thing, and all of a sudden, he lets it go. And the stone hits Goliath right there. I mean, the one spot where there's no armor, it's just bam! And it literally stuns Goliath, knocks him out. He falls face down. Boom! And then, and then, David runs up to him. This is where there's supernatural strength. The Holy Spirit powered David to take Goliath's sword. Now think about how big that thing is. And then, whoosh, cuts off his head. I know, it's in the Bible. Now, the scripture doesn't say this part, but I'm pretty sure it happened, okay? David cut off his head, picks it up, and looks back at his buddies and goes, Woo! And everybody on this side of the mountain looks at each other like, Yeah, they were rednecks from Tennessee, baby. And all of a sudden, this army, Israel, goes rushing down into the valley, and they chase the Philistines. And, of course, it was a great victory. All of Israel won because their champion, David, won. Now, some of you might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with Easter? I'm glad you asked me. The Lord showed me in the last couple of weeks as I was preparing for this message. That in essence, that's the gospel. And I was a little nervous about preaching this in the pulpit. So I started going back some of my trusted commentaries and I'm reading just to make sure that somebody else has seen this before too. Because if I'm the only one who's come up with a thought in the last 2,000 years of Christian history, I'm probably wrong. Okay? There's... You know, great men of God that are way smarter than I ever will think about me. And so I look back through some of the commentaries. Matthew Henry saw it. Jonathan Edwards saw it. Arthur Pink saw it. And others. Here it is, guys. The truth is, there's giants in the land. But it's not the giants you've heard about for the last 10 years. Typically when people preach on this subject, they're like, oh, there's giants in the land. It's your lust. It's this, it's that. We got to go beat it up. Here's the thing. You're not David. You're Israel. You're on the mountain, intimidated, and scared by the two giants in your life that you're powerless to do anything about. You know what they are? Sin and death. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. It should come on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase it. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, since sin came into the world by one man... And death came into the world because of sin. And so death has spread to all men because all men have sinned. Now what that is teaching is clearly in the fall, if you go ahead and read the rest of the chapter, what's happening is that Paul is making the case that Adam was the federal representative of the human race. God had a covenant with Adam. Adam represented all of humanity. And when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, when they ate of the fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all humanity fell into sin with them. 
by one man, sin entered the world, and death entered the world through sin. And therefore, death spread to all men because all men have sinned. All right? The moment you entered the world, or if you even want to say conception, you are a sinner. And you sin because you're a sinner. You're not a sinner because you sin. It's the other way around. You sin because you are a sinner. And you are powerless to do anything about it. And because of sin, you will die. You're spiritually dead. One day you will physically die. And unless you come to faith in Christ, you will die eternally. Eternally separated from God. Those are the giants. Those are the Goliaths that are in the valley taunting us from the time that we are born. Enslaving us. And it's winner take all. And because we sin, we are enslaved to it. And we're powerless to do anything against it. And because of that sin, because of our sin nature, we are born spiritually dead. And we're going to physically die. And unless we come to faith in Christ, we will spend an eternity away from him. And it's called the eternal death. They are the Goliaths in the valley talking trash against us. And we're the Israelites on the mountain, scared and trembling because we know we can't defeat them. But thank God, there's another David. His name is Jesus. And according to Matthew chapter 22, he is the son of of David and he is our champion he too was sent by the father to this earth bearing gifts and so he was born of a virgin and he lived a sinless life on this earth and as he grew and as he matured he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed with the devil because the Lord was with him and he was anointed of the Holy Spirit to do it. Amen. And so Jesus walked around in his earthly ministry and he healed the sick and the lame could walk and the leopards had their bodies cleansed so that they were healed and the blinded eyes were open and the deaf ears could hear and the mute tongues could speak and demons were cast out and multitudes were fed with a few fish and a few loaves of bread and Jesus could walk on the water and he could calm the winds and the storm and he could raise the dead. In fact, Jesus messed up every funeral he ever attended. Bearing gifts and blessings from the Father. But more than just bringing gifts and blessings from the Father. He came as our champion. To defeat the giants that we were powerless to do anything about. In fact... Jesus accepts the challenge to knock out the Goliath of sin and the Goliath of death. And as it became crystal clear in the latter half of his ministry that that's what he came to do was to go to Calvary, the sin of his people, to save them, to set them free. The elder brother just like David's elder brother made fun of him, so did the elder brothers, if you will. The Jewish people, the Jewish nation, was very critical toward Jesus. They called him a bastard. They called him demon-possessed. They thought his heart was evil. They thought he was evil. 
thought he claimed to be the Messiah when in fact he was not. He was just practicing witchcraft and sorcery just to deceive people. They were very critical of him. And not only that, the leadership wanted Jesus to fight a certain way. Just like Saul wanted to put his armor on David in 1 Samuel 17, so the Jewish religious leadership wanted to put their robes on Jesus. They wanted him to be a certain way. In other words, if you are the Messiah, Jesus, then what you should do is you should come and start a war against Rome. Rome at this time ruled over Judea or Jerusalem or the Jews. And they said, if you're the Messiah, then you have to do it this way. This is how I want you to fight. I'm going to put something on you, and you're going to start a war with Rome. And you're going to defeat Rome. And then this Jewish nation, Jerusalem, Judea, is going to be the head of all the nations. And Jesus says, no, that's not me. And he took it off. That's not how I came to fight. Instead, Jesus killed the giants of sin and death through his death. Look at the scripture. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, meaning humans, seed of Abraham, we share in flesh and blood. Fundamentally, we are all the same. Did you know that? He himself likewise partook of the same thing. Okay, so you and I are natural flesh and blood. Jesus partook it. In the original language means he grabbed it forcefully and took it upon himself. In other words, God became man in Jesus Christ. And then listen to this. Through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, the devil, and then deliver all those through whom the fear of death they're enslaved to all their lives. What? What? That is as crazy as David facing Goliath with a slingshot. Our David, Jesus Christ, faces down Satan with the cross. Instead of calling down millions of angels, instead of just saying, be gone. He, through death, destroyed the one who had the power of death. The devil. And this is why in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 24 and on, Jesus is going to Jerusalem and as he is going, he's picking a fight. He's poking them in the eye. He's calling them hypocrites. He says things like, you whitewashed tombs. You make the tombstone look good, but you're still full of dead man's bones. You go get a cup out of the sink that had milk in it from yesterday and you wash the outside, but you leave the mold on the inside. He said, you guys, will, man, you will go to the ends of the earth, you'll cross the sea just to force someone to become like you and to follow all of your religious rules and all you've done is made them a twofold child of hell because now they think they're saved and they're worse all to begin with. Yeah. yeah, you ought to read Matthew chapter 23. It's a pretty good sermon. Amen. Well, unless you're the Pharisee. And what was he doing? He was, he was like pushing them in the shoulder. Like, come on, I dare you to do something. Because now listen, listen, 
Jesus was in full control. He clearly taught, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. And because I had the authority to lay it down, I also had the authority to take it up again. Jesus was in full control right down to the very nanosecond that he died. To fulfill prophecy. And so Jesus is our David. He's the greater David who faces down the greater Goliath. Satan, whose tools are sin and death. And because that all human race is enslaved to it. And so Jesus, through death, defeats it. How? When Judas, Jesus chose him to be one of the twelve and said, you're a devil. When he chose him, Judas played his part. He betrayed Jesus in the night of the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying. And that started a chain of events. And Jesus went through six different trials. Three were religious, three were civil. He finally gets to Pilate in these civil trials. And Pilate interviewed him. And Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. He sends him to Herod. Herod couldn't find any fault. Sends him back to Pilate. Pilate tried everything he could to release him. And yet the Jewish people and the religious leaders of Jerusalem are out there and they're yelling, he's not our king, crucify him, crucify him. And so Pilate has one more thing that he can do to try to get Jesus released. He gives the order and they take Jesus, the soldiers, and they strip him of his clothing and they tie him up to a whipping post. And soldiers come out that are trained in the sadistic art of whipping someone who's about to be crucified. And this whip frays out on the end, attached to the very ends of the whip is like rock and bone and other sharp objects. And they're so trained that they, every time that they would whip someone who was tied to this whipping post, it started about their shoulder blades, went down to about their calves. And every time that the whip went in, whoosh, they would pull out flesh and muscle. And it was exposing the inside of the victim. Can you imagine? The Lord of glory who created all things, including every human being who has ever lived and every will live, willingly gave his back to be whipped by his very creation? By the time he had been filleted like a fish, he was already in trouble. He was suffering from shock because of the loss of blood. His heart rate is pumping extremely fast, trying to replace the blood volume. Um, his kidneys stop producing urine to try to maintain the fluid level. And the person becomes extremely thirsty. They become discombobulated. And this was Jesus. And after they whipped him, they put a robe on him and a crown of thorns, and he's holding a scepter, and he's standing there. He's already been beaten. He's already been spit on. He's already had his beard plucked out. And here he is, looking like hamburger meat, standing there facing his people. And Pilate brings this guy named Barabbas up, who's a horrible individual, was guilty of every single thing they accused him of. Murder. Insurrection against Rome, and on and on it goes. And Pilate says, I have one more. There's a custom. You guys get to choose who you want to go, who you want me to release. Barabbas? Everybody hated Barabbas. Or Jesus. See, Pilate thought by having him whipped that they would, it would play on their sympathies. But instead, the Jewish people said, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas got to go free. Jesus took his spot. That too was the gospel. Because the reality is you and I are Barabbas. 
I know you came Easter and I'm supposed to make you feel good, but the truth is you're a horrible individual. So am I, especially before we came to faith in Christ. Now we're a new creation. It's a whole different story if you're saved. But if you're not saved, you're a horrible individual. You're guilty of everything everybody says about you. See, God, God tells us in his word, if you've broken one commandment, you've broken them all. So it's all a matter of what standard you look from it. If you look from God's standard, not good. Hmm. Pilate, you know, washed his hands, can't do anything about it. Gives the order. They take Jesus, they put the cross beam on his back. They force him to carry his own instrument of death to Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull. And I'm sure you know or have read that Jesus got to a point where he couldn't carry. They had to have another individual to help him. Eventually, Jesus gets to the point where he's going to be crucified. They lay him down on the cross beam, and they stretch his arms out, and they take spikes. It's about nine inches. And they drill him or hammer them into his hands. Bing! Bing! If you've ever hit your funny bone, you realize it's not so funny. And where they put the nails, that's the nerve that would have been crushed. So you can imagine the intense pain as this is happening. Once he's nailed, of course, they put his feet, they nail his feet to the cross, and they raise it up and it falls into place, the hole that they've dug. When that happens, the jar of it causes his shoulders to be dislocated. So now he's hanging like this. And the only way to get any breath is to kind of stand on the feet, kind of force yourself up with feet that have been nailed. And what ends up happening is the nail rips through the feet until it locks up against the ankle bone. And oh, by the way, your back that's just been ripped open by whips is having to scrape up and down that cross as you try to breathe. Most people, most people, die of asphyxiation they can't do it they just give out and they hang right here and they literally drown they die suffocate jesus kept bringing himself up and down the cross scripture says there was darkness over the land from 12 in the afternoon until three The Jews have a custom in that time that they can't leave somebody on the cross when it's dark. So they wanted to take Jesus' body off the cross, but they also had to ensure that everybody was dead. And so the Roman soldiers took a big stick, broke the legs of the criminal on the left side of Jesus, who deserved to be there, deserved capital punishment. Broke the legs of the criminal on the right side of the cross, who also deserved to be there, deserved capital punishment. Why did it break their legs? So they can't breathe. It was ensuring that they would die quickly. But when it came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs. Why? To fulfill scripture. The scripture tells us not one, not one bone of his body would be broken. Instead, they took a spear and they kind of rammed it in between his rib, rib cage. What it did when it pierced out blood and water comes out, those in the medical community know that was a sign of death. It was blood and water. Gone. Go back up just for a few minutes. Right before Jesus died, he mustered all the strength that he could. And he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And when he did, there was an earthquake. And in the temple, that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. It was as if God reached out and just went whoosh. 
In other words, it was symbolic saying that the presence and the power of God was no longer going to be contained in some temple somewhere in the Middle East behind some curtain. The presence and the power and the grace and the mercy of God is now rushing out of that temple in the Middle East and it is covering the earth like the waters cover the sea. And everybody, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, it doesn't matter, has access to God and grace and forgiveness and mercy because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary. It was as if our David threw a stone at Goliath and it knocked him out. But then they took Jesus off the cross and they buried him in a tomb. And there he was. Everybody was concerned. Jesus died. Jesus died. Rome thought they solved a problem of an insurrectionist. The Jews thought they got rid of a blasphemer. His disciples were scared, hiding in fear. And that's the way it was until Sunday morning. Or sometime late Saturday night, if you follow that, it doesn't matter. They recognize it happened when daybreak on Sunday. So all of a sudden, they go. And when they get there, the stone is rolled away. And there's an angel. And the angel says, why do you look for the dead among the living? He's not here. He has risen just like he said he was. See, Jesus came up from the grave. Death could not contain him. The grave could not contain him. Not only did he throw that stone at Goliath and stun him, he took his head off when he rose from the dead on Sunday morning. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. Hold death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those two giants, sin and death, were dealt, they were defeated. They were destroyed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And now every person who repents of their sin and places their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ is set free from the power of sin and no longer has dominion over you. You are completely set free. According to Scripture, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. If you were an alcoholic before, you are no more. If you were promiscuous before, you are no more. If you were a homosexual before, you are no more. If you were a blasphemer before, you are no more. If you were an atheist before, you are no more. If you were a saint worshiper before, you are no more. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Sin has been broken off of you because of our David, Jesus Christ. Not only did our David defeat the Goliath of sin, he defeated the Goliath of death. Now, this is interesting. Because obviously we can look around and still see that people die. We have loved ones that have died. There's been church people that have died. It's a physical death. You see, th th think with me. Adam and Eve in the garden, when they sinned, they died spiritually. Then they died physically. Watch this, watch this, watch this. When you're saved, you're born again spiritually. You're made alive spiritually. And there's coming a day where that will happen physically. It's the reverse. Okay, so in other words, people still die physically, but they've already been made alive spiritually. So that Jesus says in John chapter 11, if a man dies, yet shall he live. 
for a Christian to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of God. So our death is, 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 is death. I mean, for those who are still here, we sorrow, we grieve the loss of a loved one. But the reality is, if they're in Christ, they're way better than we are because they're not in the body right now. They're in the presence of God because our David defeated death on the cross of Calvary. And not only that, there's coming a day when even physical death is going to be destroyed. In fact, there's coming a day that Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to return with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet with the Lord, and so shall we forever be. And death will be destroyed. Revelation 21 says, death will be no more. God will wipe every tear away from our eyes. No disease, no sickness, no dying. It's all defeated because our David, Jesus, beat Goliath, Satan, in the death, burial, and resurrection. Glory be to God. <laughs> it was winner take all. Just like, just like it was for David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, it's winner take all for the son of David and Satan. When Jesus won, he sets us free. So that if you're in Christ, you are the victor. You're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. Not because of anything you did, but because the champion did it for us. I mean, I, I, mean, I can, listen. And just like the Israel, after they saw the victory, all of a sudden they chased the enemy. So it is now with the church, we had the victory, and we're still standing against the enemy. And Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you would, stand to your feet with me this morning. I want to talk to those of you that are not saved. You know who you are. You can pretend if you'd like, but you know in your heart if you're not saved. If you're not saved, you're still on that mountain, shaking in your boots. Because the Goliath of sin and the Goliath of death still owns you. You're enslaved to it. But as we learned this morning, Jesus Christ, the true champion, came into your valley and fought those giants for you. He defeated sin and he defeated death. He defeated sin on the cross so that when you come to faith in Christ, you're justified, the scripture says. You're made in right standing before God. You are forgiven. He defeated sin and he breaks the power of it off of you. And he defeated death on his resurrection, ensuring that though we die, we never really die. We keep living in his presence and one day, even physical death will be destroyed and we will receive our resurrected bodies. That's the message for you this morning on this resurrection day. That if you're not saved, you're still enslaved in fear of the giants of sin and death. But the true champion, Jesus Christ, came into your valley. He came into your life and he defeated those giants for you. You don't have to do anything but believe. Confess your sin. Ask for forgiveness. And confess that Jesus is Lord. According to the scripture, if you've done that, you will be saved. So I clearly ask, clearly ask, is there anyone here today who needs to come to faith in Jesus Christ? I can't explain 
what that feels like, but you know it. The Holy Spirit dealing with you. He's drawing you. you he, he begins, we call it conviction. He's dealing with you. And is there anyone who needs to come to faith in Jesus Christ? Who needs to repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ? Who needs those two giants defeated in their life? there's anyone in this room, will you raise your hand right where you are and say, just pray with me. We're not going to make a spectacle. We're not going to embarrass you. We want to pray with you. I see some hands going up. Is there anyone else? Anyone else who needs to come to faith in Christ? Needs those giants defeated? Today's the day of salvation. This is not manipulation. It's not even a fear tactic. It is a statement of truth. None of us are promised tomorrow. Today's the day we need to come to faith in Christ. Several hands were raised. If you raised your hand, I'm going to say a simple prayer, and I want you to say something similar. I don't want you to repeat after me or anything like that. There's no, there's no power in the prayer. It's just that it's a way that we confess our sin and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It has to be from the heart, because you can say it with your lips and it may not matter. In fact, it doesn't matter unless it's from the heart. All right, so if you raise your hand for salvation, I want you to stay and pray something similar to this. Father God, I recognize that I'm enslaved in sin. I've been in fear of death. I recognize the true champion, Jesus came to this earth and he defeated those giants in his death, burial, and resurrection. I confess that I am a sinner and I need salvation. And I also confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Those of you that are born-again Christians, let me talk to you for just a second. Jesus, the true champion, came and defeated those giants in your life. You are free from sin. You don't have to be in bondage to it anymore. Its head has been taken off by the true champion, Jesus. And if you are going back into sin and you're dabbling with sin, you need to repent of that and confess right now. A battle has already been won on your behalf. Your victory was already established in Jesus Christ. Why are you going back to it? That giant is powerless over your life. And I also want to encourage you that he defeated death. Therefore, you don't have to live in fear, as in Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. You don't have to live in fear anymore. Because really, as Paul said, to die is gain. It's to be in the presence of Christ. And so now you're set free to live. For the glory of God. And no matter what comes your way, you take it with a smile and you keep going because God is using all things for his glory and ultimately it will be for your good. It will be to advance his kingdom. He's growing you and maturing you so that you are formed and conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, don't live in fear. Our champion Jesus has defeated that giant for you. You should be free of fear. Live faith. Come on, take just a moment right where you are to confess, Christian. If you're going back to sin, you don't need to. Jesus has already set you free from that. The champion defeated that giant in your life. You're not a slave to sin anymore. You are a child of God. You've been adopted into the family. You're an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. Come on, Christian. If you've been living in fear, now's the time to confess that and repent of it. 
God is with you. God is with you. And no matter what you're enduring right now, it is for a purpose, even if you can't see it. You will one day when you gather around his throne. It will all make sense. Till then, do not live in fear. Our champion Jesus has defeated death. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask my wife to join me on the platform and we're going to say a prayer for you this Easter. If you don't mind, if you'll raise your hand right where you are. Father, I thank you for every person that was here today who came to the house of the Lord to worship and to hear the preaching of your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take what was spoken and you would penetrate their heart with it all day as they gather around with their friends and their families to celebrate. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to them even more than what was preached about how our champion, the greater David, Jesus Christ, defeated the giants in our life. We are free. Lord, I pray for every marriage that's here today. I pray you bless them. I pray they'll be stronger than it's ever been. I pray that the hearts of the fathers will be turned back to the children and to the grandchildren. And I pray that the next generation's heart be turned toward their elders, that they would listen and they would receive instruction. And I pray, God, that you would empower your church to do great exploits for the kingdom of God until you return. We do not live in fear. We live in faith. We move onward. We march forward. We take territory for the kingdom of God, and we will do so until you return. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said... Amen, amen. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Day. We'll see you Wednesday night.